Okay, so we're there in Second Chronicles chapter number 15, and the title of the sermon this morning is Taking Courage. Taking Courage. If you look at verse number 8, notice verse number 8, it says, And when Asa heard these words, and the prophecy of Oded the prophet, he took courage, and put away the abominable idols out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin, out of the cities which he had taken from Mount Ephraim, and renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord. So notice what it says here. When he heard the words... He took courage. When he heard the words, he took courage. And it's quite interesting because you actually see, as we, as we go through the chapter, we'll just quickly go through it and then we'll go to a number of other places as well. But look back at verse number one. Look at verse number one of the chapter. It says, And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded. So notice what it's saying here. It's saying, look, the Spirit of God came upon him. And when the Spirit of God comes upon people, we see them speaking God's word boldly. You don't need to turn there, but in Acts chapter number four, Acts chapter number 4 and verse number 31. Acts chapter number 4 and verse number 31. It says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Notice that's what happens. When someone is filled with the Spirit, they speak God's word boldly. And this is we see what's going on there. Verse number 2, it says, And he went out to meet Asa, and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you while ye be with him. And if ye seek him, he will be found of you. But if ye forsake him, he will forsake you. Now, understand here what this is referring to. This is referring to the fact that when we, the Bible says in James chapter 4, it says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. You see, there's an element to which God responds to what we do. That's what it says in James chapter number 4, verse, I think it's verse number 12. It says, draw nigh to God, means draw near to God, and he will draw nigh or, or come near to you. Okay? Um, this is not when it talks about forsaking here. This is not talking about like in terms of salvation. I mean, Jesus himself said in, in, in Hebrews, I think it is, Hebrews chapter number 13, he says, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Okay? He's never going to leave thee, nor forsake thee. There's nothing that, that someone, when someone is saved, there's nothing they can ever do to lose their salvation. Okay, because it's, it's eternal life. That's what was promised. It was eternal life. It was everlasting life. But having said that, God can draw nigh to us or he cannot draw nigh to us. He can forsake us in the sense when we're forsaking him, then there is a forsaking, but it's not eternal forsaking, if you like. Okay, so it's important we understand that. Um, look at verse number three. It says, Now for a long season Israel hath been without, a, without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. So they, were in a, they weren't in a situation where they had a good understanding of God. You know, it says, it says they, they were out the true God. Their understanding of God, it was, it, was, it was obviously distorted and it was wrong. They didn't have a teaching priest. They didn't have the law. But then look and see what it says in verse number four. But when they in their trouble did turn unto the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found of them. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 7, he says, Ask and it shall be given you. Um, seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be un opened unto you. Jesus said, if you seek, then you'll find. If you seek God, then you will find God. And that's exactly what they did. They turned to the Lord God of Israel. They sought him, and he was found in them. Um, look at verse number, uh, verse, verse number five. It says, And in those times there was no peace to him that went out, nor to him that came in, but great vexations were upon all the inhabitants of the countries. And nation was destroyed of nation, and city of city, for God had vexed them with all the adversity. Be ye strong, therefore, and let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. Verse number 8. And when Asa heard these words, and the prophecy of Oded the prophet, he took courage, and put away the abominable idols out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin, and out of the cities which he had taken from Mount Ephraim, and renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord. So notice what happens here. When he heard God's word, he took courage, didn't he? It says um, he took courage. So he took courage because of hearing God's word. But not only that, he took courage, and then it says he put away the abominable idols. In other words, he heard God's word, he took courage, and then he did something. He actually, he actually took some action. And it's important when we hear God's word. When you hear God's word preach, don't just let it, you know, oh, that's great, that's really encouraging, and then you don't do anything. Okay? You need to take action on what God's word actually says. Look at verse number 9. And he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and the strangers with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh and out of Simeon, for they fell from out of Israel in abundance when they saw that the Lord his God was with them. So they gathered themselves together at Jerusalem in the third month, in the fifteenth year of the reign of Asa. And they offered unto the Lord the same time of the spoil which they had brought, seven hundred oxen and seven thousand sheep. So notice, they, they, they gathered together. 
they all gathered together and then also they sacrificed. Now obviously the sacrifices they, that they did um, in the Old Testament are different than what we do now. Okay, We don't sacrifice animals the way they did in the Old Testament. The reason for that is one of the reasons why they did sacrifice these animals was because it was pointing forward, it was looking to Jesus. Okay, Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. When, when Jesus came on the scene, John the Baptist said to him, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So they were sacrificing lamb after lamb after lamb, looking forward to when God himself would become a man. He would come to earth as the man, Jesus Christ Jesus, and he would be sacrificed. He was the lamb that was sacrificed. Okay? But the fact is, we still do sacrifice. Okay? There, there are other things. You know, I mean, um, it says uh, Romans chapter number 12, I think it is. Romans chapter number 12. In verse number 1, Romans chapter 12, and verse number 1, says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So it says here, look, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. So it's not saying sacrifice your body in terms of you know, sacrificing in that sense, but saying we need to offer our bodies, we need to offer our lives um, because it's our reasonable service. In other words, we might think, well, I want to do this or well, I want to do that, but what does God want me to do? Okay? And that's why the next verse says, and be not conformed to this world. Because the natural thing that we will do is just fit in with everyone around us. We'll just behave the same way everyone else behaves. But is that the way a believer should be? Is that the way a Christian should be? Should we be the same as the world around us? No, we shouldn't. We should be different. You know, and there's lots of scriptures talk about that, about us being a, a, a peculiar people. We should be different. We shouldn't be like the world. Okay? Um, back in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter number 15, 2 Chronicles chapter number 15, verse number 12, it says, And they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul, that whosoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. And they swear unto the Lord with a loud voice and with shouting and with trumpets and with cornets. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart and sought him with their whole desire. And he was found of them, and the Lord gave them rest round about. Now, this might be a little bit of a confusing passage because it says, They entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers, with all their heart, with all their soul. And whosoever is not going to do that is going to be put to death. Okay, now there are people throughout history who have done that sort of thing. You know, I mean, John Calvin actually springs to mind. He did that in Geneva. He had all sorts of rules and regulations. And if you didn't go along with what he said, you know, I mean, there was a guy, um, I can't remember, the guy, whatever, it started with S, whatever it was, the guy that got, that got, that got put to death, there was a, a, specific, a specific famous person who was put to death by him. And the reason was, because, well, because he went to church. He went to church there. And so they laid hold on him and, you know, and people said, well, why, why did he go there then? Because in Geneva, if you didn't go to church, it was against the law. Okay, and so there were people who would come and arrest you and there were all sorts of punishments and imprisonments for that. And, and the people have done this. But is this the right thing to do? Is this what? Seeking God is good, but is saying, let's force everybody to seek God. And if you don't seek God, well, you know, there's going to be consequences. No, that's not the right thing to do at all. And in fact, I mean, we can see, it says, look, they swear unto the Lord with a loud voice. And um, in verse 15, and all Judah rejoiced at the oath. Well, it says in, um, uh, actually, have a look, just... It's important the Bible says prove all things. So I'm telling you a lot of things, and some of them you're reading from the Bible, but it's also important to see, to see for yourself when I quote you something. So, for example, in James chapter number 5, James chapter number 5, in verse number 12, it says, But above all things, my brethren, swear not. But isn't that what they just did? It says, Swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, lest you fall into condemnation. So saying, you don't just swear, you don't just make these oaths and, and things like that. It says, don't swear like, just like, when you say yes, then mean yes. When you say no, then mean no. It says, lest you come into condemnation. So here they're actually doing something that they shouldn't have been doing. And we see that throughout the chapter. There were things they did that were good, and the things they did that weren't good. Um, verse, number, verse number 16. It says, and also concerning Maacah, the mother of Asa the king, he removed her from being queen because she had made an idol in a grove. And Asa cut down her idol and stamped it and burnt it in the brook Kydron. But the high places were not taken away out of Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was perfect all his days. And he brought into the house of God all the things that his father had dedicated, that he himself had dedicated, silver and gold and vessels. And there was no more war until the five and thirtieth year of the reign of Asa. So we see... 
there were good things they did, but at the same time, there were things that, you know, they did some things that were good, and they did some things that were not good. Turn, if you would, to Numbers, chapter number 13. We're talking about this morning about taking courage. Taking courage. Here we saw this prophecy was done, it was God's word was preached, and the king took courage. Have a look at Numbers, Numbers, chapter number 13. Numbers, chapter number 13. Numbers, the fourth book in the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Numbers, chapter number 13. <coughs> Numbers, chapter 13, and verse number 1. Numbers 13, and verse number 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of, of Paran, all those men were heads of the children of Israel. And these were their names, of the, of the tribe of Reuben, uh, Shemua, the son of Zachur, of the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, the son of Hori, of the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephani, of the tribe of Issachar, Igel, the son of Joseph, of the tribe of Ephraim, Oshia, the son of Nun, of the tribe of Benjamin, Paltai, the son of Raphu, of the tribe of uh, Zebulun, Gadiel, the son of Sodai, of the tribe of Joseph, namely of the tribe of Manasseh, Gadai, the son of Susai, of the tribe of Dan, Amiel, the son of Gamali, of the tribe of Asher, Sethur, the son of Michael, of the tribe of Naphtali, Nabai, the son of Vophsai, of the tribe of Gad, Gul, the son of Machai. These are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy at the land. And Moses called Oshia, the son of Nun, Jehoshua. So there's a couple of notable characters here. We saw there was Caleb, the son of Jephani, and we've also got, we've got um, Oshia, or Jehoshua, who's also called Joshua. Okay, so we're sent to spy out the land. Verse number 17. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and said unto them, Get you up by this way southward, and go into the mountain, and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many. And what the land is they dwell in, whether it be good or bad. And what cities they be that they dwell in, uh, whether in tents or in strongholds. And what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not. And be ye, notice this, be ye of good courage, and bring the fruit of the land. So he's telling them, be of good courage, be brave, don't, don't be frightened. Okay, Go in and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob, as the men... Uh, come to Hamath, and they ascended by the south, and came unto Hebron, where Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmai, and the children of um, Anak were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And they came into the brook of Eshkol, and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bear it between two upon a staff. So notice that they've cut down a cluster of grapes, and it's so big that they're having to carry it on a, on a staff between two of them. That's a pretty big bunch of grapes if you can't, if one person can't carry it. Okay? So it sounds like it's a pretty, it's a pretty amazing land where they've got to. It says, um, and they bear it between two upon a staff, and they brought of the pomegranates and the figs, and the place was called the brook Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel and to the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them, and unto all the congregation, and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them, and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. So they're saying, look, this is what it was like. It was a great place. You know, this is the fruit that we've got from there. You know, and it's a land that flows with milk and honey. It's just like, it's an amazing place. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled, and are very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea, and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses, and said, Let us go up at once, and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. So notice what happened, happened here. So they've described how all these people are there, and it's, it's, it's like, there's these people, and there's these people, and the cities are big, and we can't get in, and, and the sons of Anak, that's talking about the giants, and the people... He says he had to still them. So obviously the people are like, no, 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 we can't go in there. <coughs> and it says, and, um, but the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. So notice of these people, you've got Caleb and Joshua, but then you've got the other ten that say, no, we can't do it. We can't go up and do it. They're, they're too strong for us. And they brought up, notice it says here, an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. 
And all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. So, I mean, notice what they're saying there. They're saying, look, we can't do this. They bring up an evil report. But then they even, they're exaggerating. I'm mean, just saying, look, we were like grasshoppers. I mean, who's ever seen a grasshopper? You've seen a grasshopper? How big is, how big is a grasshopper? We sometimes get them like the wee cicadas or something like that. You know, you bring the washing in and then you go, someone's going to put it away and you hear this sort of chirping coming out of the washing basket. And Because they're not big, are they? So compare a grasshopper to a person. Now, do you think that's how big the giants were? No, because the Bible does talk about giants. Remember Goliath? You know, there's various giants that are talked about. But it actually gives the height of them. And you're talking about maybe 10 feet tall, something like that. I mean, there are people within, you know, that sort of height. I mean, we've had people in recorded history that have been really, really big. You know, I'm not really, really big. I'm, uh, well, I, I, I'm halfway between 5 foot and 6 foot, but I'm probably heading closer to 5 foot as each year goes past. But, you know, there are people who are really big. You know, some of the you know, basketball players and stuff, they're, they're really, really big. Okay? But the difference between, you know, my height versus someone who's, you know, 9 or 10 feet tall, it's not like a grasshopper down at your feet, is it? Okay? So what these people are doing, they're exaggerating, they're, they're, they're lying, you know. And, and there can be, there's a real temptation that we can face sometimes where people can be tempted to lie, because that's what exaggeration is, in order to strengthen your case. Because obviously they, they're not wanting to go there, and so they're trying to make it worse than it really is. So they say, well, we're like grasshoppers. Is that true? No, it's not true. Okay? And so... It's an important thing. God is a God of truth. He doesn't want us to lie. He doesn't want us to, to say things that aren't accurate. Even, and I mean, the tendency is, if you've got, you know, I mean, like you'll often see someone, will, they might have someone they don't like. You know, this person's, maybe this person's doing something wrong to you. Maybe they're your enemy. But what does the Bible say that we should do to our enemies? We should, we should hate them. We should lie about them. We should treat them badly. Is that what it says? Is that what it says? No, that's not what it says. It says we should what? Love your enemies. Yeah, yeah. So we shouldn't, be, we shouldn't be lying about our enemies. So even if there's someone that you really don't like, even if there's someone who's actually a bad person, guess what? It's still wrong for you to lie about them. It's still wrong. And that's, but they shouldn't be doing that, okay? Um, look at um, just the start of the next chapter. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. So these guys, the ten spies, give their bad report. And what does everyone do? They're weeping. They're weeping and crying. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses, against Aaron. So they're all complaining. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would God we had died in this wilderness? They're saying, look, it would be better off to have died back in Egypt. It would be better if we just died right here than to go and die there. Well, it's pretty silly. I mean, who said they were going to die there? You know? Um, they're just, but you see, because of, the, because of the bad report that was brought back, because they were discouraged by the report of the ten spies, you know, they're feeling down about it. And wherefore, it says, verse 3, hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey. Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain, let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, the land which you pass through to search it, is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defence is departed from them, and the Lord is with us, fear them not. So these guys are doing the opposite. They're saying, look, we can do it, we can do it. Now, we won't bother keep on reading because they, they don't like it, they, they want to stone them and stuff, but let's just move on from there. So... We can see here there's a clear difference. You've got two groups of people. You've got ten who came back with a bad report. They said, we can't do it. And two came back and said, look, we are able to do it. Now turn, if you were to Deuteronomy, chapter number one. Deuteronomy, chapter number one. There's just the book after numbers is Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, chapter number one. And look at verse number 20. Deuteronomy, chapter number one. And verse number 20. Deuteronomy, chapter one, and verse number 20. <clears throat> It says, And I said unto you, <coughs> You are come unto the mountain of the Amorites, which the Lord our God doth give unto us. Behold, the Lord thy God hath set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath said unto thee. 
fear not, neither be discouraged. So notice what he's saying. He's saying, look, don't be discouraged. Um, verse number 22. And ye came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, and they shall search out the land, and bring us word again by what way we must go up, and into what cities we shall come. And the saying pleased me well, and I took twelve men of you, one of a tribe. So this is, re he's recounting what we've just read about in Numbers. Yeah. And they turned and went up unto the mountain and came into the valley of Eshcol and searched it out. And they took of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down unto us and brought us word again and said, It is a good land which the Lord our God doth give us. Notwithstanding, ye would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God, and ye murmured in your tents and said, Because the Lord hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites <coughs> to destroy us. Okay, so I mean, does that even really make sense what they're saying? Your God brought you out of Egypt, he brought you through the wilderness because he wants to take you here so you're going to be killed. Does that really make any sense? It doesn't, you know, it's irrational what they're saying. Verse number, verse number 28, Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts. So notice what's happened. Because of the report of the spies, their heart was discouraged. They've discouraged our hearts, saying, The people is greater and taller than we, and the cities are great and walled up to heaven. Moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakims there. Um, look down at uh, oh, verse number 29. There I said unto you, Dread not, neither be afraid of them. The Lord your God, which goeth before you, he shall fight for you, according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes, and in the wilderness, where thou hast seen how that the Lord thy God bear thee, as a man doth bear his son, in all the way that you went until you came into this place. Yet in this thing ye did not believe the Lord your God. So he's telling them, look, this is what's happened previously, and God's going to be with you again. And, and isn't that true when they actually end up going in there? And we talked about that just a few weeks ago. Remember, they went around Jericho, didn't they? They went around and around the walls of Jericho, and what happened? The walls fell down flat. Did they do that? No. God was fighting for them. Um, verse number 33. Who went in the way before you to search you out a place to pitch your tents in, and a fire by night to show you by what way you should go, and in a cloud by day. I mean, these guys had seen the pillar of cloud by day, and the pillar of fire by night, leading them through the wilderness. And the Lord heard the voice of your words and was wroth. So God wasn't happy about them complaining. And we should take that to heart. God doesn't like complaining. Throughout the whole, you read, I mean, the Bible says what sort of things were written aforetime were written for our learning. The reason why we read the Bible is there's stuff that we can learn in it. And one of the things is that God doesn't like people complaining. He was wroth and swore, saying, Surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land which I swear to give unto your fathers, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh. He shall see it, and to him will I give the land that he hath trodden upon, and to his children, because he hath wholly followed the Lord. Also the Lord was angry with me for your sake, saying, Thou also shalt not go in thither. But Joshua, the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Okay, and so he's saying, look, encourage, he's, he's, he's telling Moses, look, encourage, um, encourage Joshua, because he's going to go in and he's going to possess this land. So the focus of the sermon this morning is taking courage. I mean, maybe if you just think about it, what are the words discourage and encourage, what do those words actually mean? To encourage means to put courage into someone, you know, to give them the courage or the confidence they need to do something. Well, whereas discourage, it means to take the courage out of someone so that they can't actually do something. And that's exactly what we saw the 10 spies do in Numbers 13. In contrast to this, back in 2 Chronicles 58, we see Asa taking courage when he heard the prophecy of, of, of Odi the prophet. Okay? Um, Moses was told to encourage Joshua. Um, we saw that in verse number 38. Look at chapter 3 and verse number 28. Verse number 3 and verse number 28 of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 3 verse 28 says, But charge Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him, for he shall go over before this people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which thou shalt see. Okay, so notice here we see that um, encouraging is likened to strengthening. You know, putting courage into someone, it enables them to do something. Strengthening someone, it gives them the strength to do something. Now there's two ways to encourage or discourage someone or to strengthen or to weaken someone. The first thing is by what we say. Okay, now, how did the spies discourage the rest of the Israelites? What did they do? It was by what they said. They came back and they said, look, we can't do this. We can't do this. The people of the land, they're so big, we're like grasshoppers compared to them. But of course, what we say can also encourage others. It can strengthen them. 
It can make them think we can do it. I mean, it's an important role that, that a parent has as a children, you know. Um, as parents, we should be encouraging our children. It says in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2 and verse number 11, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 11, it says, And you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. That's the normal thing. That's, that's, that's what a parent should be doing. You know, because we can see how much potential they have, but often they don't, they don't see it. It can be the same within a church, you know. I mean, that's why we need people to, we need to help people see their potential. You know, I mean, recently the, the, the boys have been learning to drive, and it's interesting, you know, when you first start driving, and if you start driving and it's like, especially if you start like with a manual instead of like an automatic, it's a bit easier, but if you start with a manual, it's good to do with the manual, because that way you can do both. Um, but at the start, you think, well, how can I do this and do this at the same time? How can I do this? And it can be tricky. And people think, well, I can, I can never do this. I can't do this. But of course, you know, hopefully, well, presumably, the person who's teaching them to drive, they know that they can do it. Why? Because you used to be like that, and you learned how to do it. You know? And I mean, when I take the boys out driving, I mean, it might seem strange now, but I watch them driving, and I know it's only going to be a few years before they are better drivers than me. I just know that for a fact. Why? Because I'm not as good a driver as I used to be. I mean, when you get older, your reactions start to go, your eyesight starts to go. And I, honestly, I'm not as good a driver in terms of ability-wise as I was. Now, I should drive a bit slower and allow for that and, and, and play it safe. But I know that's a fact. That, you know, when these guys are, are, are when, when, when these guys are in, those, in their 20s, they're going to be better drivers than me. Because they'll, they'll have more skills than I will. They'll have better eyesight, they'll have better reactions, all that sort of stuff. Okay, and so we can see, but, but of course, it actually takes work. It actually takes some work. I mean, it's not, just, it's not magic. If they just, let's say then they never drove. Uh, suddenly when they hit 25, are they going to be great drivers? No. You know, so it actually, take, it actually takes work in order to do it. I mean, the same thing within the context of the church. I mean, going soul winning, that's something where a lot of people think, well, I can never do that. But the fact is, I mean, I remember that when I didn't used to be able to, to preach the gospel or soul win, okay, and I know what I was like, and I know how you can learn to do it, you know. But it does take work, you know. Um, it says in Proverbs 14, 23, in all labour there is profit. You want to have some profit, you want things to go well, you need to put some work into it. Okay. Um, now, when it comes to encouraging, it's important that we encourage people to do right. You see, because there, there is a bad sort of encouragement. Um, don't need to turn there, but Psalm 64, verse 5 says, they encourage themselves in an evil matter. They commune of laying snares, probably they say, who shall see them? So and it says you, they encourage themselves in an evil man. You can encourage someone to do what's wrong. Okay? You can encourage someone to, we sh instead, we should be encouraging people to do what's right. You see, I mean, many, many preachers, they actually encourage people in a wrong way. They don't encourage people in the way, in the way they should be. I mean, they, basically what they do is they just tell people what it is that they want to hear. You know, the fact is, in, in churches all over the country, all over the world, there are many people that go along to church and the person will stand up and they'll just tell them exactly what they want to hear and they'll go, for, go away feeling really good. But the fact is, sometimes we need to hear what God says, which doesn't line up with what we already think. You know, I mean, look at, um, look at Jeremiah chapter number 8. Jeremiah chapter number 8 and verse number 11. Jeremiah 8, 11, page 773. Jeremiah chapter 8, verse number 11 says, For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly saying, peace, peace. So notice that they're saying, peace, peace. They're saying, hey, it's all great. Peace, peace. But what does it say? When there is no peace. So does that sound good? Someone's standing up saying, peace, peace. It's all great. Everything's going to be fine. When it's actually not. <coughs> Excuse me. Look at, um, uh, look at Ezekiel, chapter number 13. Ezekiel. So just the book after, after Jeremiah, you've got Lamentations, then you've got Ezekiel. Ezekiel, chapter number 13, page 845. Ezekiel, chapter number 13, verse number 10 says... Because even because they have seduced my people, saying peace, when there was no peace, and one built up a wall, and others, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. So look, they're saying that it's the same thing. They're saying peace, but there's actually no peace. You say, well, should you really be preaching and saying, should you be saying bad things about these other preachers who say things are good when they're really not? Well, just look back at the start of the chapter. Look back at the start of chapter, look at verse number 1. It says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy. And prophesy, to prophesy means to preach. Okay? Prophesy against the prophets of Israel. So preach against these preachers. 
that prophesy and say, and say down to them that prophesy out of their own hearts, hear ye the word of the Lord. So these people are preaching out of their own hearts, but he's saying, look, this is what God says. Thus saith the Lord God, woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. O Israel, our prophets are like the foxes in the deserts. You've not gone up into the gaps, neither have you made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. They have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, The Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Have you not seen a vain vision, and have you not spoken a lying divination? Whereas you say, The Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken. Notice that. I mean, there's a lot of people who stand up today and say, God says this. God says this. You know, oh, God gave me a word of revelation. I've got this prophecy for you. And they say something. And it doesn't come from the Bible. You know, you listen to Bishop Tanner here and all the stuff that he'll say. Where's he getting that from? He's making it up. He's making it up. He's saying, thus saith the Lord, when God didn't say it. And I mean, obviously we know about Bishop Tanner. There's plenty of people that, you know, just in regular churches, not some sort of crazy one like his one. And it's exactly what they're doing. Okay? And God says, no, look, that's not what I've said. I didn't say that. You see, look at um, uh, 2 Timothy chapter number 4. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. See, this is what God commands preachers to do. 2 Timothy chapter number 4, verse number 1 says, I charge thee therefore before God and Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead as appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. You think about when something's in season. That's sort of like, you know, you might think of clothes, you know, this is in season, or oh, was this is that was last season's one. And when it's in season means when it's popular, out of season means when it's not popular. So he says, look, you're supposed to preach the word in season, out of season. And then notice what it says here. It says, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now does that sound nice? You come to church and someone's going to reprove you, someone's going to rebuke you, and then someone's going to exhort you. And exhort means to encourage. Okay, so what we see here is being reproved, that's told that you're wrong. Hey, this is wrong what you're doing. You know, rebuke, that's being told you're wrong even stronger. And then exhort means you're being encouraged to do what's right. So hey, look, this is wrong, this is wrong, and this is right. Okay, um, it says verse number three, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. There will come a time when God's people won't want to listen to what the Bible says. They will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. There will come a time when people will preach what the Bible says, and people go, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. Okay? I mean, did you know that the Bible says that women are supposed to have long hair? Did you know that? Have you been in a church and heard someone say that? Have you been in church and heard someone say that men are supposed to have short hair? 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, half a chapter describes the fact that men are supposed to have short hair and men and women are supposed to have long hair. The Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. But people think, oh, well, I, well, I saw a picture of Jesus one time and he had long hair. Well, it doesn't matter what sort of picture you saw drawn by someone. Okay? That doesn't matter. I mean, they were painted by Renaissance artists. And if you look them up, look up those Renaissance artists. Look up Michelangelo and all these guys that did all those drawings. Look them up. And they were deviants. I mean, honestly, look it up. Look up history and find out what those people did. They were people, you know, they, would, they were really into young boys. They were perverted people. There's a whole pile of homosexuality. And so they paint Jesus and a lot of their paintings... I mean, and is that the case? You go, is it like the Sistine Chapel or something? You go and look at the Sistine Chapel. What is in there? Is it naked people? Is, is that not the case? It is. Okay? It's naked people. Now look, if you went to my house and I had all these paintings, I had this artwork all over the wall, all over the wall of naked people, what would you say about me? Wouldn't you say I was a pervert? You would, wouldn't you? You should. You should, because that's people that like to have naked people display. Now, the Bible, there is a place for when nakedness is okay. You know, husband are married when they're wife. Yeah. Husband and wife, they're naked and they're not ashamed. But apart from that, it's actually a shame to be naked. Okay? And so, they go, it goes hand in hand. The same people that paint Jesus with long hair are the same people that have got them all stripped off all the time. Okay? Because they're perverts. But anyway, that's, sorry, I'm not quite sure how that came in. But, the point about it is, people don't want to hear that. People don't like that. People say, well, I want, I'm a man and I want to have long hair. I'm a woman and I want to have short hair. 
Well, it doesn't matter what you What does God say? That's the key thing. What does God say? Um, look at Jeremiah chapter number 23. Jeremiah chapter number 23. Jeremiah chapter number 23 and verse number 1. Jeremiah 23, verse number 1, page 787. <coughs> I understand. This, I'm just about to read the Bible here. It says, look, Woe be unto the pastors, woe unto the pastors, that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people, ye have scattered my flock and driven them away, and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord, and I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Look at chapter number 10, Jeremiah chapter number 10 and verse number 21. Jeremiah chapter number 10 and verse number 21. Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 21 says, For the pastors are become brutish and have not sought the Lord. Therefore they shall not prosper and all their flocks shall be scattered. The pastors are brutish. It's like they're like, you know, they're like a brute, like a dumb animal. It says they're brutish and have not sought the Lord. You see, they're not seeking, they're not looking in the Bible to get the message to preach. You know, they're getting it from somewhere else. I'm not sure where it's from, but it's not from in here. Okay, look at, um, look at chapter number 3. Chapter number 3, Jeremiah chapter 3, and verse number 15. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse number 15 says, And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. That's what pastors are supposed to do. Feeding them with knowledge and understanding. When you come to church, you should, when you go home, you should have learned something that maybe you didn't know before you came to church. Not just hearing the same old thing every week. God is love, God loves you. Those are both true. But I mean, if that's all you hear every week, are you growing and learning and knowledge and understanding? No, you're not. Look at Acts chapter number 20. Acts chapter number 20. Acts chapter number 20. And verse number 28. Acts chapter number 20. And verse number 28. And this is Paul talking to the Ephesian elders. This is like his, like his last thing he was going to say to them. He says, Acts chapter 20, verse number 28, he says, Take heed therefore, so he, this is Paul speaking to pastors, speaking to elders. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and unto all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. So what, what are you supposed to Feeding the church of God. In other words, and it's not saying, what are we supposed to feed them with? Like, like the flock of God, are we just giving them hay or something? No, it's saying feed them with God's word. Why? For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw your disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. So he's saying, look, after I leave, people are going to come in and they're going to speak perverse things, they're going to draw your disciples after themselves. He says, watch and remember, I didn't cease to warn you night and day with tears for three years. So you think, wouldn't it be great to be in the Bible times and maybe, you know, the Apostle Paul to heard him preach? Do you know what he would have done? He would have warned night and day for years with tears. That's what he said he did. Okay? And so if we, so many churches, it's just like, they think, oh, it's, it's all just, it's like a social club. Everyone just comes, we'll just gather around together. It's just, it's just a, and hey, we do social activities. We go bowling, we have do fun things. But that's not what we're about. That's not the purpose. The, the purpose is to fulfill the Great Commission. And that's what we've got here. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest, he will send forth labourers into his harvest. It says, you know, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the labourers are few. Okay? The labourers are few. Um, as I was saying, yeah, many, many pastors today, because remember, not losing track of what we're talking about, we're talking about encouragement and discouragement. You see, many pastors today, they discourage and weaken others by what they say. And a great example of this, in fact, I just heard another example of it just recently, is... Um, is going back to the Greek. You've been, or going back to the Hebrew. You've been in church and, and someone says, well, you know, and they read, read out a passage and they say, well, in the Greek, and they tell you what this word is in the Greek, or they tell you what this word is in the Hebrew, and what this really means is, and then they go off and say what it really means. Well, when someone does that, do you know what they're really saying? They're really saying that it doesn't mean what it says here. Because if it meant what it said there, why would you need to go to some other language? Well, I mean, how many people here, how many people speak Greek? Do you want to speak Greek? Or can read Greek and speak Greek? Okay? I've, I've, at times, I have been able to read and speak a little bit. But I'm, was, has never been anything remotely like fluent. 
Okay? What about Hebrew? You want to speak Hebrew? Read Hebrew? No. I did one year of Hebrew at varsity. I got an A, but I, it's, I, it was, I, I cheated. It wasn't a, it wasn't a genuine A because in the exam, do you know what you had to do for the Hebrew for Hebrew exam? You had to translate a, um, a portion of scripture, and it was basically, I think it was the first half of, or might have been the whole chapter, of Genesis chapter number one. Well, if you've read the Bible a bunch of times, you've got a pretty good idea what Genesis chapter 1 says. So if you're translating something that you already know what it says, it's cheating, really. So I got an A, but I, believe me, I'm not an A. Was ne- I, even back then, I was not an A Hebrew student, okay? Um, but the thing about it is, is if I'm saying, look, you've, in, the, in the Greek it says this, and in the Hebrew it says that, you've got no way of knowing that. So how do you know if that's right or not? So what it really means is, you've got to trust me. You've got to trust me. I mean, one of the most famous examples, um, actually, look if you go to John 21. John 21 is a, is a great example of this. Um, <coughs> who's ever heard people talk about, you know, agape? You ever heard that word before, agape? So maybe you do know some Greek if you heard the word agape. Agape and phileo. Agape and phileo. They talk about, you know, God's love, God's unconditional love, agape. Whereas, you know, phileo is sort of more just sort of like, you know, brotherly love. Or it's, it's, it's nowhere near like agape is. And, and the passage they like to go to is this here in, in John chapter number 21. John chapter number 21 and verse number 15. It says, So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him again, Feed my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. Now this passage of scripture, many people use this, I've heard many people preach this, and they say, look, what's really going on here? When Jesus says, you know, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? He's using this word agape, this, you know, this unconditional godly love. Whereas Peter's replying, saying, you know that I... Phileo, you. you know, I've got this sort of, you know, this lesser sort of, you know, love. And Jesus said, it says agape two times, and then the third time, Jesus says, he uses phileo. It's like, so Jesus sort of comes down to his level. But the thing about that is, is firstly, it doesn't even make sense from the, from the passage, because it says, he saith unto them the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Well, if he'd used a different word in the sense that meant something different, he's not saying to the third time, is he saying something, something different? You know, so it doesn't actually make sense. But also, you can go and look at many places throughout the scripture, and you can see does it really? I mean, like uh, we won't turn to many of them, but for example, John chapter number three and verse number nineteen. John chapter number three and verse number nineteen. I'm not go- I know I'm going a little bit deep, but it's kind of it's important we understand these things. John chapter number three and verse number nineteen. John chapter number three and verse number nineteen says, "And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil." That word "loved" there is agape. So saying men loved with this unconditional godly love, darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Does that make sense? You know, and you can go back, and I, I don't recommend, there's no need to do it, but if you're really into it, you can go online and you can look at the different, you know, whether you can compare the translation side by side, and you see, agape is used in place, and it doesn't match up what they're saying. You know? And when someone goes down that path, they're really saying, trust me. Believe what I say. I don't want you to trust me. I want you to trust what the Bible says. Okay, you need to trust what the Bible says rather than what I mean. I mean, I heard someone else say just recently what they go. In fact, this was a person I, who I've heard preach the same sort of thing that I'm saying. Don't you didn't need to go back to this other language? And do you know what he did? He went back to another language. He went back to Genesis one and talk about Elohim, about it being plural. Okay, in the beginning, beginning God created the heaven and earth. Is that what it is? No, you can trust the Bible that you've got right there in, in front of you. Okay, um, because the thing is. If I change the Bible, then if you just read it in plain English, is that going to encourage you? Because you'll be reading it thinking, well, I wonder if this is what it really says. I wonder if I better get my study notes from the pastor and then I'll, then I'll know what it says. No. We need to just read the Bible and believe what it actually says. You see, because there's nothing that I can find in the Bible that you couldn't find yourself. You know? I mean, if you're saved, you've got the Holy Spirit living inside you. You know, it says in, in, in 1 John chapter number 2 and verse number 27... 1 John chapter 2 
and verse number 27, 1 John 2, 27 says, But the anointing, and that's talking about the Holy Spirit, the anointing which you've received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth of all things, and of truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. He's saying, look, the Holy Spirit which you've got, he says, look, it teacheth you of all things. He says, you need not that any man teach you. Okay? So that means there's nothing I can teach you that you couldn't learn just by yourself by reading the Bible. Okay? If there's something you could only get from me, then it's not true. Because it didn't come from here. If you've got the Holy Spirit, if you're saved and you're reading the Bible, you can get it yourself. Okay? Now, I'm, saying, I'm not saying therefore we don't need teachers. I mean, look at Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter number 4. I'm not saying that we don't need teachers. I mean, the Bible says, look, we don't need anyone to teach you, but the fact is God has ordained that we should have teachers. Look at um, Ephesians chapter 4, and verse number 11, page 1181. Ephesians 4 verse 11 says, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the <coughs> edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children. You see, God doesn't want us to be children. He doesn't want us to be babies. Now, when someone gets saved, what happens? They get born again. They become a child of God. What are they? They're a baby Christian. But the fact is, God doesn't want us to stay that way. He wants us to grow. Peter said, but grow in grace. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, he says, look, don't be, more, don't be any more children. Why? It says, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. You see, if you're a child, isn't it easy to fool a child? Can't you, it's really, you can do magic tricks on them, can't you? Because they're really easy to, to fool. You know, because that's what children are like. Children are gullible. Don't be like that. Okay? We need to grow up, grow in our knowledge, grow in our understanding. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, <coughs> even Christ. Okay, so, and that's why I like to use plain speech. When I'm preaching, I like to use plain speech. And the Bible says, wherefore having this hope, you know, we use great plainness of speech. Okay, if, you, if there's anything that I preach and you don't understand, please you know, come and ask me afterwards. I want you to understand. That's the point. That's the purpose of it. Okay, so... We can encourage each other by words. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we have church. One of the reasons why we have church is so that we can encourage one another. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, um, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. That means encouraging one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. So we need to be gathering together and encourage one another and more. You see, a lot of churches today, they're not gathering together more. They, they have less church. You know, we have church on a Sunday morning. We have church on a Sunday night. A lot of churches don't have church on a Sunday night anymore. They just have one service on a Sunday. We have church in the middle of the week. A lot of churches don't have a midweek service anymore. Okay? But the Bible says it's so much the more. So that we can learn, so we can grow. That's the purpose of it. I mean, you're um, in Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse number, look down at verse number 29. Verse number 20, 29. It says, look, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. Edifying, it's like think of like an edifice of a building. Okay? It's talking about building up. The good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. So look, you can't use your salvation, because you're sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So should we be speaking evil? Should we be filled with malice? No. It says, verse 32, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So we should, we should have kind and encouraging words for those around us. What, why is it that we should be kind? Because God is kind. God is kind. It says in, in Titus chapter 3, it says, But after that, the kindness and love of God our Saviour toward man appeared. You know, um, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. <coughs> um, look at uh, look at Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter number ten. Second Corinthians chapter number ten. Second Corinthians chapter number ten. You see, there's a, there's a lot of people um, in Baptist circles even where they they like to speak harshly, it's, and they kind of think it's it's a good thing to speak harshly. Now there are times in the Bible that Jesus used harsh words. 
But look at see what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. He says, Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Jesus, according to the Bible, was meek and gentle. Who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, whether I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. It's not a physical battle. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. It's all about, it's a battle for the mind. It's about what you're thinking. And having a ready, in a readiness to revenge your disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. You see, a lot of people want to correct everyone else. I want to correct everyone else. But it says, look, having a, re a readiness to revenge your disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Sort yourselves out first. You know, Jesus talked about like, looking out for the, 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 the moat that's in your eye. Um, so the, the, the moat that's in your brother's eye, but not considering the beam that's in your own eye. You know, get yourself sorted out first. Um, Let's have a look at, um, oh, yeah, yeah, turn it through to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. I mean, a, a great example of someone who <coughs> encouraged people. How many people have heard of Job? You might have heard of Job. And this guy went through, through some really hard times. And Job, um, his comforters came and they weren't really much help to him. And uh, he said to them in, in Job chapter 15 verse 6, he said, I would strengthen you with my mouth. That's what encouraging is. When you're strengthening someone, you're encouraging them in what they can do. Okay, you're there in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, verse number 1. It says, furthermore then, this is Paul speaking to the, the church of Thessalonica. He says, furthermore then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus. He's, he's, he's exhorting, he's encouraging. Mm -hmm. Exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you've received us, how you ought to walk in to please God, so you would abound more and more. He said, you received us. We've told you how to please God. We want you to do it more and more. He says, for you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. He said, look, we gave you God's commandments. These weren't suggestions. These were commandments. For this is the will of God. This is what God wants. Even your sanctification that you should abstain from fornication. He says, look, you want to know what God's will is? God's will is abstain from fornication. You know what fornication is? That means sleeping with someone when you're not married to them. He says, that's what you should not be doing. He says, abstain from fornication. Why? It's, it's a wicked sin. Okay, that's what God says. That every one of you should know to possess his vessel in sanctification and honour. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Um, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He says, look, God's called us... Not to be unclean, and that's when you sleep with someone you're not married to, that is unclean. Because when you sleep with someone you're not married to, you're actually sleeping with every person that that person has slept with. And that that person has slept with, and that that person has slept with. You know, what happens? What happens when someone sleeps with a prostitute? What happens? They, they're sleeping with thousands of people. Because every bit of disease that that person has, that's how it gets transmitted. Okay? It's unclean. It's filthy. Now people say, oh, okay, well I wouldn't sleep with a prostitute. Okay, but well you'll just sleep with someone who acts like a prostitute, but they just do it without getting paid. In fact, we won't turn there, but the Bible talks about it in the book of Ezekiel. It actually talks about who someone who does that is, says they're actually worse than a prostitute. Do you know why? Because he says, well, at least the prostitute's getting paid. At least they've actually got to read it. At least they're, they're trying to put a roof over their family's head or doing something, paying the bills with it. Whereas you're just doing it for no reason. You're actually, it's worse than a prostitute. Okay? Um, Verse number 8. He therefore that despiseth, desp despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. Just say, look, if you despise this, it's not me you despise, it's not man. It's actually God. You're despising God. Because God says, don't do this. And do this instead. But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for yourselves are taught of God to love one another, and indeed you do it toward all the brethren which are all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more, that you study to be quiet, to do your own business, to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that you may have lack of nothing. And so he's like, he's encouraging, this is what you should do, this is not what you should do. Okay? Um, so, we've seen that words can encourage. 
We can encourage people by the words we use, or we can discourage people by the words we use. But the second way we can encourage or discourage others, goodness me, I have to speed up, is that is by what we do. What we do can encourage or discourage others. Look back at Numbers again. Look at Numbers chapter 32. Numbers chapter number 32. <clears throat> Numbers chapter number 32. Numbers chapter number 32 and verse number 1. Numbers 32 verse number 1. It says, Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of cattle. And when they saw that the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, that behold the place was a place for cattle, the children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spake unto Moses and to Eleazar the priest and unto the princes of the congregation, saying, Ataroth and Dibon and Jazer and Nimrah and Heshbon and Eliali and Shabim, Shebim and Nebo and Beom, even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel, is a land for cattle, and thy servants have cattle. Wherefore, said they, if we have found grace in thy sight, let this, let this land be given unto our servants for a possession, and bring us not over Jordan. See, so they're saying, look, we've defeated these people on this side of Jordan. God's promised us the promised land. We're supposed to go over Jordan. He's saying, look, we'll just stay here. We don't, we don't want to go over Jordan. We like it here. We'll just have this place, is what they're saying. And Moses said unto the children of Gad, and the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war, and shall ye sit here? Wherefore discourage ye the heart of the children of Israel from going over unto the land which the Lord hath given them? He said, look, are you going to stay here while we go over to fight these battles? You're going to discourage us by doing that. Thus did your fathers, when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea, to see the land. <coughs> For they went up unto the valley of Eshcol and saw the land they discouraged the heart of the children of Israel that they should not go into the land which the Lord had given them. So he's, what's he talking about? What we just read before. Remember how the spies, this is what he's going back to saying, this is what happened before. They discouraged him. And the Lord's anger was kindled at the same time. And he swore, saying, surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt from 20 years old and upward shall see the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh, the Kenazite, and Joshua the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord. <coughs> and the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness forty years until all the generation that had done evil inside the Lord was consumed. So because of what they did back there, they ended up wandering around in the wilderness for forty years until all those people that were twenty years old and up had all died. You know? So people, you know, and someone must have died youngish, you know? Um, but everyone that was twenty and above they all died, except for Joshua and Caleb. And behold, ye have risen up in your father's stead. So you're the descendants of these people. An increase of sinful men to augment yet the fierce anger of the Lord. You're adding to God's anger if you're going to be doing this. For if ye turn away from after him, he will yet again leave them in this wilderness, and ye shall destroy all his people. And they came near unto him and said, We will build sheepfolds here for our cattle and cities for our little ones, but we ourselves will go ready armed before the children of Israel until we have brought them unto their place, and our little ones shall dwell in the fit cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return to our houses until the children of Israel have inherited every man his inheritance. For we will not inherit with them on yonder side Jordan or forward, because our inheritance has fallen to us on this side Jordan eastward. And Moses said unto them, If you will do this thing, if you will go armed before the Lord to war, and will go, all of you armed over Jordan before the Lord, until he hath driven out the enemy, his enemies before him, and the land be subdued before the Lord, then afterward ye shall return, and be guiltless before the Lord, and before Israel, and this land shall be your possession before the Lord. But if ye will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Okay, great verse. So he's saying, look, if you do that, then that's great. If you do what you said you're going to do, that's great. He says, but if you don't, Watch out, your sin is going to find you out. Okay, so we need to be aware that what we, what we say is going to affect other people. It can encourage them and discourage them. But what we do will also have a big, big effect. Look, if you look at Proverbs chapter number 23. Proverbs chapter number 23 and verse number 19. Proverbs chapter number 23. <coughs> Proverbs chapter 23 and verse number 19. Proverbs 23 verse 19 says... Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Be not among wine bibbers, among, among riotous eaters of flesh, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. So look, this is a, a, a parent is warning their child, look, don't be among drunkards. Don't be among wine bibbers. Okay? Because what's going to happen to the drunkard and the glutton? They'll come to poverty. And drowsiness, it'll make them lazy, it'll clothe a man with rags. 
Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. By the truth and sell it not also wisdom and instruction and understanding. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. You want to make your parents happy? Be a wise child. Do what's right, and you'll make them happy. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. But then look and see what it says in verse number 26. Verse number 26, it says, My son, give me thine heart, <coughs> and let thine eyes observe my ways. So it's not just about what the parent's saying, is it? It's about, what am I doing? He's saying, let thine eyes observe my ways. It means, watch me. That's exactly what it's saying, because what you do, you know? I mean, how convincing would it be if a, if a parent's saying, you know, don't smoke, kids, don't smoke, and then, don't smoke. I mean, isn't it a fact that most, you know, the majority of people who smoke, their parents smoke, you know? That's because that's where they learn it from. Okay, and you can say don't smoke, don't smoke all you want, but if you're smoking, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's common sense, you know. Um, First Timothy chapter four, verse number twelve, it says, "Let no man despise thy youth." And this is Paul; he was talking to a to a young young preacher. He said, "Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, and conversation, and charity, and spirit, and faith, and purity." He says, "Look, let no man despise what you say," but he also said, "But be thou an example." Be their example. Be someone they can follow. You know, First Peter two twenty one says, "For even here are two we called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow us, follow his steps." Now Jesus taught a lot, but he also did. You know, so people could follow in his steps. How can I encourage by what I do? By obeying God. You see, when you when we resist sin, it encourages others that they can do the same. When we give in to sin, what's that going to do? Encourage others that they can follow that same example. You know, um, Galatians 5, 9 says, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. A little, a little bit of sin, it spreads. You know, it spreads. Um, and in fact, that's also, that's also one of the reasons why, that's why people, the Bible says there are things that people should be thrown out of church for. The Bible says if someone's a drunkard, if someone's a fornicator, if someone's, you know, a railer, that they should be thrown out of church. Because why? Because if they don't, then it's going to spread. And then, there will be lots of people. I'm not being at church like I was in a church one time where I mean adultery. It was just like it was just widespread, and there's people. It was like it was like swapping partners. These people they're sitting here and changing, and it's just like it's all fine. It's bizarre. It's absolutely bizarre. But of course, people have the attitude today to say everyone's welcome in church. Everyone's welcome. Well, guess what? Everyone's not welcome. There are things that the Bible says put away from among yourselves that wicked person. There are things that people should be put out of church for. Now, it's not that we want them to stay up for it. It's like, hey, get it right, and then come back. You know, if you're drunk, stop being a drunk, and then you're welcome to come back. But we don't want drunks sitting here so that, you know, our children look and say, oh, it's fine to be a drunk. Yeah. No, so, hold oh, look, you're a drunk, go away. Stop being a drunk, and then you can come back. Okay? And it's, it's, for, their, it's, for, the, it's for their own good. That's, that's the purpose of it. Okay? Um, <coughs> Another example of, of leading people the wrong way, we were in John 21 before. If you read earlier on in the chapter, we see Peter, instead of fishing for men like Jesus told him to do, Jesus told him, and of course, that's one of the reasons, why is the reason why people just allow everyone to come into church? Because they have this idea that that's how people get saved. Bring them into church, and they'll hear the sermon, and they'll get saved. Not that most of them is going to, you know, that's the right gospel from half of them anyway. But Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel of every creature. The Bible says go. Okay? Go. And that's how people are going to hear. You go and you preach the gospel to people and then invite them. Yeah, hey, come on down to church. And that way you're free at church to preach the whole Bible and not just preach the thing, you know, the little bits that unsaved people can handle. Okay? Um, but getting back to Peter. So Peter, he'd been told to fish for men. But instead of fishing for men like Jesus told him to, he went back to regular fishing. At the start of John 21. He went back to just regular fishing. Do you know what happened? The other disciples said, oh, you're going fishing? will come to. They went back to their old lives. Okay? Half the disciples followed them. You know, when we go down the wrong path, it will encourage others to do the same thing. Um, I better say time, I'll chop a chunk out. Okay, so we can encourage, we remember we saw in Psalm 64 verse 5, they encourage themselves in an evil manner. We can encourage others to do wrong, but on the other side of the coin, when we do what's right, it will encourage others to do what's right. You know, I mean, back in March, lots of us, we read through the, the whole New Testament in a month. Okay, we have our, our Bible March. Okay, and it's a real encouragement. 
to read our Bibles when we do that, to read our Bibles more. Think about coming to church. I mean, when you see people being faithful to all of the church services, that encourages them to be faithful too. But what happens if someone comes on to church? Oh, where's so and so? Oh, well, they're just not here. I'm thinking, oh, okay, well, I'm, you know, I won't always come. Now, understand, you don't have to come to church. You don't have to come to church three times a week. You don't have to come to church at all, ever. You don't have to. But I mean, if you want to encourage people to do what's right, if you want to be learning and growing, then that's, that's the place to be. I mean, maybe we saw in Hebrews 10.24, encouraging. I mean, I was encouraged on, at, at, um, on Thursday night. Jordan came to Bible study, and he was going off to work that night. After, work, after Bible study, he had to go so he could go and then work late. And a lot of people are oh, I've got to work, so I'll, I'll just miss it, miss it out. You know, in fact, other people have come and they've, they, they've had to leave because they've, you know, they've got work or something else on. But it's encouraging to see someone making it a priority in their lives. Um, baptism is another example. When someone gets baptised, it's an encouragement to other people who haven't yet taken that step of faith. I mean, Doreen, remember Doreen came here and she got, you know, on, she got saved on Sunday night and she got baptised on Monday. And then Fever and Arcalade, who'd been saved for a few weeks, when they saw Doreen get baptised, what are they encouraging to do? Get baptised. And they got baptised that following Saturday. Okay? It's, it's, it shows. It, it encourages. You know? Um, preaching the gospel. I mean, we talked about that before. That's what Jesus told us to do. We need to be labourers. He commanded us to do that. And it's encouraged when, when other people are keen to go soul winning. I remember um, earlier in the week, I'd had a hard day at work. I was tired. I hadn't had much sleep. And I'd heaps of work on. And I said, oh, and in fact, I even said to Maury, no, I'm not going out tonight. I'm just going to give Doug a shout and let him know I can't make it. And I looked at my phone, there was a message from him saying that he was looking forward to going soul winning. It's like, <laughs> right. So I went out soul winning because of his encouragement. Okay? And someone ended up getting saved that night. Okay? And so it's an important thing. You don't realize just those little things you do can encourage someone. You know? Now you might think, look, maybe I'd, I'd like to do some of those things, but I, I just lack courage. Well, God's word will give us courage. I mean, in fact, we should pray for courage. You know, so, I mean, a major reason why people don't go, so, go so on is because there's a fear. What would someone say? What would someone think if I did that? You know? But look, have a look at Ephesians chapter number 6. Because the Apostle Paul, you might think, oh, well, you know, that's just me. That's the sort of person I am. But the Apostle Paul, he had the same thing. Ephesians chapter number 6. Wouldn't you think the Apostle Paul was one of the boldest people you'd ever come across? Ephesians chapter number 6. He says in Ephesians chapter number 6, he says, look, praying always in all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching there unto all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me. So the Apostle Paul is saying, look, please pray for me. He says that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to, as I ought to speak. So the Apostle Paul was saying, please pray that I would open my mouth to preach the gospel to people. Well, if the Apostle Paul needed it, don't you think that we need it? Absolutely, we, we absolutely do, okay? Um, be in God's Word. When you're in God's Word, God will strengthen you. Psalm 27, 14 says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Psalm 31, 24, Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, or ye that hope in the Lord. You see, when we take courage, we step out in faith and do the things that God has told us to do, he will strengthen us. He will enable us to do it. You see, a lot of people think, well, oh, okay, I'll just pray and I'll read my Bible. I'll wait till I feel courage and then I'll do it. But no, what you need to do is actually step out and take action and that's when God's going to strengthen you. Okay? It's great to encourage one another by our words. We should all make an effort to do it. But it's got more, even more impact when we encourage each other to do right by our actions. When people see you doing what's right, that will encourage you so that would encourage them to do right, do right. And of course, and God will reward us. You see, remember, it said before, remember, we talked about in Proverbs, and all labour, there is profit. Okay? Salvation is a free gift. We understand salvation is a, is a free gift. The Bible says, for by grace you save through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But of course, after we get saved, God will reward us for the works that we do. He will reward us. Look at Joshua chapter number 14. Joshua chapter 14, we're just about done. Joshua chapter 14 and verse number 6. Joshua chapter number 14 and verse number 6. Joshua 14, verse number 6. <coughs> Actually, while you're turning, I'll just read Revelation 22, 12. It says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. You see, we're not saved by our works, but God's going to reward us for our works. 
Joshua chapter number 14, verse number 6, it says, Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephani, the Kenazite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thou thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance, and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord thy God. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years. So he's eighty-five years old. Even since the day the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And lo, now I am this day, fourscore and five years old. As yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As is my strength, as, as my strength was then, even so is my strength now. For war, both to go out and to come in. Now therefore give me this mountain, whereof the Lord spake in that day. For thou heardest in the day, in that day how the Anakims were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall, I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him, and gave unto Caleb the son of Jephunneh Hebron for an inheritance. And Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb the son of Jephunneh, the king of unto this day, because he had wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. So notice we're saying, I did what God wanted me to do. I didn't, like the other people, they made the hearts of the people melt. They discouraged him, but I encouraged them, and God rewarded me. He's given me this stuff. Okay, so let me encourage you. Read your Bible more. However much you're reading it out, read it more. Pray more. Come to church more. Preach the gospel to the lost more. Obey God's commandments more. Love others more. Be kind to others more. Even when they are, when they are unkind and unloving towards you. Because you know some people are like that? Did you know some Christian people are like that? Are unkind and unloving. Is it hard? Yeah, it is. But the Bible says that we, we know that our labour is not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. Turn if you to 2 Chronicles 15. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. The work that we do, it's not in vain. 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse number 7. He says, Look, be ye strong, therefore, and let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. That's what God says. Your work shall be rewarded. And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oded the prophet, he took courage. So he heard the words and encouraged him. He took courage. And he put away the abominable idols out of the land of Judah. So he took courage and he did something. He got rid of the bad things out of his life. Out of the land of Judah and Benjamin. Out of the cities which he had taken from Mount Ephraim. And renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord. And he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and the strangers with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh, out of Simeon, for they fell to out of Israel in abundance when they saw that the Lord his God was with them. You see, if you want God to be with you, draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. Encourage others to do what's right. Do what's right, both by word and by your example. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I just pray you'd help each one of us to be an encouragement. Help us to take courage, Lord. Help us to give courage to others. Help us with the words we speak, with the actions that we take, Lord. Help us to encourage people to a closer walk with you. And sometimes, Lord, sometimes it can seem like you're the only one, Lord. Your word also talks about how David, <coughs> David encouraged himself in the Lord. Help us to get our courage from you and to give that courage and encouragement to others. We thank you and praise you and love you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.